Hey everyone, hope you're having a great week and thanks for joining in to another Bona Training Camp video. Let's talk about some of the best practices when using and operating our Bona Power Drive. Um, some people may think of these as frequently asked questions or tips and tricks. They all kind of run along the same vein. Um, but one of the first ones is always adequate power, or proper power. So we want to make sure because our power drive is a planetary system that has a, a double reverse. So meaning that the main disc spins one way, so that's a reverse from the hub, and then the other discs spin the opposite way, that's your second reverse. That creates a lot of resistance and friction on the floor and inside the machine. So because of that, it's, it's really important that we have proper power. So the first thing we always recommend is making sure you have a Bona Power Station or some type of system like this where you can take, for instance, like we've got here uh, in the studio, since we're on a commercial site, we only have 208 coming out of the wall. So I can boost that up uh, and it gets me up to right at 230. And even though on my sanding plate back here, uh, my machine plate, it says I'm a 240 volts, 230 is gonna be fine for this machine. And we're also running this through uh, 100 feet of cable, which, is also something to keep in mind. Depending on how much cable you've got to run, you never want to start your booster right next to the wall, right next to your source, and then try to boost through 100, 200, 300 feet of cable. Always run your cable as far as you can to your booster, and then you only want to boost the last 50 feet to your machine. And the other thing to check, and this is for people who have older models of power drives as well, you know, check your machine specs, your plates. Uh, very early models of power drives uh, were wound for 220, um, and these all the later models are wound for 240, and you always wanna run as close to that as possible. So if I've got one of the 220 models, you know, even though it could run on 230, um, I may wanna just dial that back a little bit. Definitely if I've got one of the 240 models, um, usually on 208, the most I'm gonna be able to pull it up to is 230. So know what uh, your motor is wound to, use that new multimeter and all the information it can give you uh, just to make sure your machine is running the, the best that it can. Or if it's running too hot uh, or you're overloading it, this is a 16 amp overload fuse that's going to pop on you so your machine will turn off. Uh, this is just a manual reset, so uh, you may have to wait 15 to 20 minutes for the internal thermal regulator uh, to reset itself. It does it automatically as soon as the machine cools down to a certain temperature, uh, and then you can reset the manual overload here. Then you should be ready to go ahead and sand again. But you got to look back, if that ever happens, what is causing it to overload or get too hot? Uh, it could be I have bad cables, right? So if you walk along the length of your cable uh, and kind of feel that after it's been plugged in for a while, you may feel a hot spot. That is, you know, maybe your guy slammed it in the, the door of the van or somebody drove over it with a forklift. Anyway, your cable's starting to break down in there. You've got some resistance. You may need a new cable. You also always want to check uh, your plug. So any of your plugs, whether it's the one uh, on the wall, anything connected to your cable, uh, are they secure? Are they tight? Uh, probably a good option, maybe every six months, take them apart, you know, loosen them up, put them all back together just to tighten them up, make sure everything is nice and tight. And are they in good condition? Um, were you want, at a situation where maybe uh, you had a problem at the wall plug and maybe it kind of uh, sparked and, and burned your plug a little there? Might have done some bad things to the inside of your plug as well. So check your cables, check your plugs, uh, all the way along your route. Make sure that what you've got going into your machine uh, is the same with or greater than after you boost it, what you've got coming in uh, to the booster. Uh, and then we're looking at what other kind of things can I do to the machine to uh, lessen that resistance. So I may have to take off some weights if I've got some of the weights on there. Uh, I may have to go to a lesser or a finer grit of sandpaper. Maybe I'm trying to go too coarse and it's just grabbing too much and trying to cause too much resistance there. So think about some of those things that you could do to lessen the load on your machine, as opposed to keep having this thing popping every 
10 or 15 minutes and then you're having to wait to, to reset it. So adequate power, proper power, key to running your power drive. All right, so our next question revolves around transportation and it's really preventing damage to our unit uh, when we're transporting it, you know, whether it's taking it from the van into the house or uh, vice versa. The first thing you want to do though is remove the weights. Uh, and that's mainly to protect your, your wheels. Uh, we've had too many guys break a wheel because they have the weights on too and they're lugging that thing, not being very gentle with it, taking it upstairs and stuff, uh, and they'll end up cracking the spokes on these wheels. So we want to take off our weights. And it's also, even though this is going to be the next thing, the other reason you take off our weight, because if you have it stored upright like that all the time and your sanding plate is on the bottom, then it can actually warp or bend your sanding pads too, if it's just static all the time like this. The next thing we want to do is remove our drive plate and take that off. And again, it's because we don't want the machine, most guys are going to store this upright in their van. We don't want the machine just sitting on these pads uh, because it won't sit completely evenly because the weight distribution of the top of the machine isn't even. So it could give you a flat spot in a pad. It could actually bend one of these pads. So this thing is your, your baby. So always take care of it. Uh, and make sure that your drive plate in it is as in good of condition as possible. And then I always want to take off my dust skirt as well. Uh, again, th this is so key to having good dust containment, which is my customer's number one concern is getting dust in their house. So I always want to have my dust skirt in good shape. I'm always going to take that off when I'm traveling with this thing in the, the van or my truck. And then, of course, make sure you incorporate uh, the wheel covers. So usually we just leave these on all the time. I just took them off so I could talk more about the spokes and stuff. Um, but usually we'll just leave these on. Uh, you can get easy replacements if and as they get uh, torn up during use. But these are just for as you're wheeling it across to get in your customer's driveway. Um, or the parking lot or ever it doesn't get debris and stuff embedded the other thing it does and why we leave them on all the time if I'm taking uh, my machine back across some carpet or some tile or something like that uh, I want to protect those surfaces from any anything I may have gotten on the bottom of my machine uh, and thus my wheels uh, and having the covers on those is going to protect those so take the weights off take your drive plate off Take your dust skirt off, make sure you have some good wheel covers, and take care of your power drive. All right, so let's just uh, talk real quickly about the right way to put your uh, drive plate on your power drive. Uh, again, what we want to make sure is that you engage it all the way and lock it in, and don't let it do a, a slam fit. And what I mean by that is we have had a couple guys bring their machines in, and they were having trouble with them because they had wallowed out the clutch plate because they didn't get this situated all the way as close to the lug as possible and then lock it in. They were just putting it on a little and then standing the machine up and when you turn the machine on it slams into place. You don't want that to happen. Uh, because the clutch plate is not made out of, uh, it's made out of a softer metal uh, and you want it that way so you can always get a tight fit. If you routinely slam it into place, you're going to wear a soft spot into that or a hollow spot. And then the vibrations in the machine are going to constantly wallow that out. And pretty soon your machine is going to be shaking all over the place. So just make sure that when you attach your drive plate, right, get it on there, move it all the way around so that the lugs are lined up, lock it into place and you should be good to go. All right, so also one of the best practices is about your new kickstand. And we'll also talk about if you don't have one of the kickstands, although you can retrofit the kickstands onto older machines. So you may want to add that uh, onto your existing power drive. But the main reason for this is you can see if I don't use the kickstand and I, whenever I bend my machine back, especially if I have one of the sanding pads uh, right at the bottom there, all the weight from this machine is going onto that sanding pad. 
And especially if I have the weights and stuff on this, uh, it may bend that pad, then I may get some wobbling, I may get some shaking in my machine because I've damaged that pad. So then if we utilize the kickstand, you know, it puts no pressure. There's no pressure now on that single back pad at all. And I can easily lower everything down without putting extra pressure on it. So always utilize your kickstand. It'll really help increase the longevity and the smooth performance of your machine and the sanding pads. Now, if you don't have a kickstand, the other thing that you can do is when you're ready to tilt your machine back, just get it positioned so that you know you have two sanding pads sitting in the back here. And then at least I'm tilting my machine back on two pads and not just forcing all that pressure back on one. So if you have your dust skirt on, which I took this off, just to make it easier to see, um, pull the dust skirt off and then just get, you know, one of your pads kind of aligned with this back wheel here, tip it back. And then again, at least I've got uh, pressure on two of the pads being here and not just on a single being down at the, the apex on the bottom. So best thing to do, just get one of the new kickstands, add it to your existing power drives. And if you've got one of the 2025 units, use that kickstand every time. So another thing that having this machine out for 10 years has shown us, actually you guys as our customers have shown us this, is some of the different ways you can actually adjust the handle uh, to run it, to help it make it even more versatile for you and help you get into some really tight spaces. So typical running position uh, when we're running the power drive, because it has that floating effect, is only gonna be about 10 degrees backwards. Right, and then we'll be able to push in our safety buttons and turn the on levers uh, and get this machine running. Sometimes I usually do this, don't quite get it all the way back enough. So then just uh, adjusting it just a little more, getting it back and then it turns on and I'm, re and I'm ready to go. Um, I've also seen some guys run it like this. So this, because this is in still that 10 degree area my safety catch, which is down in here, which it releases based on the angle of this, it's still good. But they do this because then it's easier for them to maybe uh, push that cut point up around more to the front of the machine or if they're trying to get next to the wall. Uh, or maybe it's just more comfortable. If they're a little uh, shorter in stature, uh, you can adjust it this way then too. In fact, you could adjust this even further back and get this handle set up forward to whatever's most comfortable for you. We've even seen some guys take it to the extreme where maybe they were faced with, you know, a completely open stair design, but the flooring runs all the way underneath the stairs as they go up. Um, so they will take this and put the handle all the way forward so that they can get it underneath the stairs and then they're operating the machine from here or we even saw a post the other day where uh, one of the customers was doing a, a kitchen island tabletop and they, were, they had the power drive up on top of that. But again, because of you know, lights and other stuff overhanging and you don't really want to stand up on that, they had the handle bent over like this so they could access that tabletop. So those are the kind of the three positions that we're looking at mainly when we're running it as the Bona power drive. And then of course, once we take the power drive plate off, anything else that goes on there, we're gonna run it more as a normal buffer. Uh, we're gonna run it at hip level um, because now you have that centrifugal force trying to pull whatever plate you have on one way or another based on your pressure on the handle. Whereas when it's up and we're running it as a power drive, it's got that floating effect. And one word of caution, you do not want to run the power drive down in this position. The machine's going to bounce and wobble and shake all over the place. So mess around with the handle positions, know how to run it in power drive position or in buffer position, and you should be set for just about any scenario that comes your way.
All right, so last question or last best practice for today uh, revolves around steel plates and intermediate pads. Where do I use them? Why are they useful? Um, let's first look at steel plates. Uh, highly recommend that you get uh, at least a set of these and be prepared to use them in your system. Uh, they're gonna keep the floor completely flat um, and help if, if you have, if maybe you did your first sanding with your belt sander or drum sander, you've got a little uh, chatter in the floor like you can see here, but this is really from the, the manufacturing process. We haven't even sanded this yet. Uh, it's going to help get that chatter out. Whereas if you only use the drive pads on this, it may follow the chatter, chatter a little bit. So it may look like it takes it out, but it's not going to take it out. So steel plates can really help you with that. They also prevent any kind of dish out whatsoever. So keeping your floor uh, completely flat. So we'll always use them in conjunction uh, with a quarter inch intermediate pad. So your abrasive goes directly on the steel plate. Uh, that goes to your intermediate pad. And then your intermediate pad is going on your power drive. And that gives you a little bit of a floating system too. So it doesn't make it so stiff that if I come to a high spot in the floor, uh, I'm still probably gonna get a little bounce. That's just the machine telling me I got a high spot here. But if I had a super stiff system on there, it's gonna try to really jump up on that high spot and this thing's gonna be shaking and rattling and rolling all over the place, which may not be bad for taking out the high spot, but it may be putting some scratches off the high spot that I don't want. So just soften that up a little bit with your quarter inch intermediate pad, but utilize those steel plates. They can do nothing but good for you. They also help to soften the scratch, actually. You may think, well, it's stiffer. It's probably gonna put a worse scratch in the floor. It actually softens it because most of your scratches that you see in the floor, they're in your hard grain. And because the steel plate keeps everything on top, it's not going to dip down into your soft grain at all. It's gonna keep everything up on top of the hard grain and take those scratches out where you typically see them. Uh, and then intermediate pads, again, we got uh, a couple flavors, uh, quarter inch, which we're gonna use 95% of the time. Uh, and sometimes guys just like to use this, especially if they want maybe more dish out. Um, maybe that's the look they're going for in the floor. You can always just put a quarter inch intermediate pad on your system, put your abrasive directly on that, and, that, and that's gonna give you a little more dish. If you're working on a floor that's hand scraped or somehow you know distressed or pillowed edges or something like that, you need a little more uh, flexibility to your abrasive system, then you could go with the half inch intermediate pad, put that on your system, uh, put your abrasives directly on that, and then you're gonna get you know a little more uh, conformity to the floor and those different uh, surface types. And then one other thing that we really use the quarter inch pads for is to save our Bona Diamonds. So these are fairly expensive, but they last a really long time, anywhere from 5,000 to 10,000 square feet. Using them on wood or uh, wood finishes just is not going to wear these out. The diamond is obviously harder than that. Um, but what will wear it out is if you constantly take it on, off, on, off, on, off, a Velcro type system, eventually you're gonna be tearing the, this backing off of your diamond and then it's done anyway. So we'll use quarter inch pads, put our diamond on there and keep this as a set. So even if we're say just putting it on here or we're putting it on our multi-disc, when we're done with that particular uh, phase of abrasion, we will take off this as a set. That way any wear and tear is going on your intermediate pad and not on your diamond, which is more expensive than the intermediate pad. So, and we'll just keep those as a set in our box until we feel the diamonds have worn out and go from there. So quarter inch, half inch intermediate pads, bonus steel plates, uh, learn how to use all of these on your power drive and just increase the versatility in your own sanding approach.